Hi everyone, this is Dr. Nelly. So today is the uh, we're going to be finishing up on the gas chapter, uh, gas topic, and if, to finish off the chapter, we're going to talk about something called real gases. So you know what's real gases and what what what's different about it from ideal gas, which is the type of gas that we've been talking about all this time. Well, if you remember back to the ideal gas equation. Um, we made certain assumptions in the ideal gas equation uh, that's based on the kinetic molecular theory, right? So those are called the postulates of the kinetic molecular theory. And in the kinetic molecular theory, we made the assumption that the container volume, um, you know, the, the volume where the gas is put in, is relatively large compared to the distance between the particles. And as a result, that makes it that you have a lot of space in the container, so the gases can be really far apart from each other, and that's important um, as part of the derivation of the ideal gas equation. Okay, so in other words, we pretty much assume that the gases themselves occupy very, very little space. So if you remember in the ideal gas equation, we usually just assume that the volume available to the gas is the entire container. Uh, the entire volume of the container. So we don't really think about the fact that the other gases are taking up space because their volume is so small compared to the volume of the container. So that's the first assumption that we made. We made the assumption that the volume of the gas is really really small and matter of fact it's uh, negligible compared to the volume of the container. The second assumption we make in deriving the ideal gas equation from the kinetic molecular theory is we made the assumption that there's no intermolecular interactions between the gas particles. Uh, you know, you can say that it's insignificant, but basically we just neglect it. We just don't assume that there's anything at all. Um, we just assume that there's no interaction whatsoever between these particles. Now, this type of assumptions, uh, they're true <clears throat> as long as you make sure that the following conditions are also true. And the two conditions that matter here to make sure that a gas behaves ideally is that the temperature has to be high uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what high means in terms of actual numbers but the temperature has to be high because when you have uh, the gases at high temperature they're moving very fast right remember that the temperature relates to the kinetic energy which relates to the speed of the gases and if they move very fast then there's really no um, significant interactions between the molecules because they're moving so fast that for all intents and purposes, there's no time for them to make any significant intermolecular interaction. Uh, the second you know, condition that has to be satisfied is the pressure has to be low. Now if you think about low pressure, low pressure really means that there's not a lot of particles, right? There's very uh, low number of uh, moles of particles. If there's very uh, small number of particles, that means you pretty much have you know, large volume. If you're talking about volume compared to the number of particles, then you have large volume of the container relative to the number of particles that you have. So that satisfied this assumption right here. Okay. The question is what happens when we don't have these conditions? In other words, when we have low temperature and we have high pressure. Okay. So the you know this this type of situations were studied and the person who actually studied this was um, uh, Johannes van der Waals, and he actually made these studies back in the in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s, and you can see it in the graph here that's uh, plotted uh, comparing the behavior of gases uh, at you know the ideal condition, which again is the high temperature, low pressure condition, versus what we refer to as the real condition, which is the low temperature, high pressure condition. Okay. And as you can see here, uh, when we're, uh, the line here at, you know, there's a line that's horizontal line here at 1. So that's the expected behavior for an ideal gas. Okay. So if you do this, this uh, y-axis here is PV over RT for 1 mole of gas. In theory, this should equal to N. And if N is equal to 1 mole, then the value should always be 1. Uh, whether you're changing pressure or not, right? But as you can see here, this is what we expect for an ideal gas, this line right here at 1. But what you see here for actual gases, as you increase temperature, I mean, uh, uh, I'm sorry, as you increase pressure, you see that the value of this curve 
PV over RT actually changes quite a bit. For helium, it goes all the way up here. Uh, for something like uh, water, it actually drops down all the way here. So none of them is actually near the ideal gas uh, line itself. They're only close to the ideal gas line when you have pressure in this range here, which is, you know, low pressure, which is the pressure in the range that we operate in, one atmosphere. That's where the ideal gas equation usually holds correctly. But as you go further away from the um, low pressure condition, as you go to higher and higher pressure, you see that these curves all start to deviate, right? They start to uh, change from what you expect from the behavior in the ideal gas equation. So as a result, Van der Waals came up with uh, an equation to express the behavior of uh, real gases. Now, I want to emphasize the, the difference here between ideal and real gas. We're not talking about a, a different, you know, type of gas. We're not talking about, you know, ideal being, let's say, helium and then real being, you know, some other gas like argon or something. We're really talking about the same gas. We're, you know, we're just talking about helium, for example, uh, but under low pressure condition, helium will behave ide ideally. Under high pressure condition, helium will behave like a real gas. Okay, so really we're, when we're talking about ideal and real gas, we're talking about the same gas. It's just that the conditions are changed. When the conditions are changed, then you have this different behavior as a result of it. Okay, so let's talk about the, um, change, you know, the, the substitutions that uh, Van der Waals made to the ideal gas equation. So we're going to start here a little bit with the ideal gas equation itself because that's, you know, remember if we're in the ideal condition, then this equation works just fine. So the ideal gas equation, of course, is PV equals nRT. So we're going to change that and write it as P equals nRT over V, okay? Now remember what uh, I said earlier. One of the things that, you know, uh, the two assumptions that we made with the ideal gas equation are listed here, right? So what happens when we start changing pressure, we start increasing pressure, okay, or lowering temperature, but primarily if we increase pressure, so you think about it, what happens is if you start increasing pressure, there's more and more particles, right? And as a result, if you think about the situation here, okay, if I were to draw it here on a, on a scratch paper right here, initially I have, I imagine the situation to be ideal where I have, you know, let's say two gas particles and this is the container. So obviously the volume of the container is relatively large the gas particles are very far away from each other and for all intents and purposes they don't occupy any volume right because they're so small okay now when I increase pressure really what I mean is that I either make the volume smaller the whole container smaller I increase the number of gas particles so let's say it's the same container but now I have a lot more gas particles okay now at this point, there's a point when the pressure goes up where you can no longer ignore the volume of the gas particles. It's sort of saying, you know, if I were talking about in this in a lecture hall, you have all these stuff in the lecture hall, your chairs, the other students around you. In the ideal gas equation, we're making the assumption that the volume of the lecture hall is basically the, all the volume available for you to occupy, okay? but in reality, of course, if you want to calculate how much volume is available to you, you have to subtract the volume of the lecture hall from the volume of everything else in the lecture hall that occupies it, the, the desk, the tables, the instructor, the um, other students, and so on. And that's really what the real gas condition is talking about. So this is what we consider ideal, and this is what we consider real, okay? In the real gas condition, you have to worry about the volume of all of these other gases. So the volume available, the volume of the container, which is the volume available to a gas in the ideal condition, is no longer true. The volume that's available to a gas in the real condition would be the volume of the container minus the volume of the other gases, right? Other gas particles here, okay? All of the ones that occupy that same container, okay? So how does uh, uh, Van der Waals make this um, correction? So what he did, what he uh, did was again starting with the ideal gas equation, which is right here. 
he said that in order to correct for that volume effect I need to subtract the volume of the other gases how do I get the volume of the other gases well he said that I need to know what is the number of moles so n number of moles of all the gases that I have here right so that's counting the number of particles and then I'm going to multiply this by what we call the volume factor okay which is uh, given the uh, symbol B so this is often called the Van der Waals VDW just uh, you know just short for Van der Waals Van der Waals constant uh, B okay so this is sort of a this is a measure of basically the volume of a particle and later on we'll talk about that there's values of B has been measured for many different gas particles but basically he's saying that if you want to correct for the volume you're gonna to have to subtract that volume in the container by this NB quantity which corresponds to the volume of all the other gases that occupy that same container okay alright in the next video I'll talk about the correction for the other uh, the other correction for intermolecular attraction.